Christmas with the characters. From 1986 to 1990, the characters recorded Christmas songs and skits for the members of the characters fan club. This is the story of those recordings. September 12, 1982, Danny Salazi, vocals, rhythm, guitar, John Greco, drums, and Chris Roselle, lead guitar, get together for the first time in Danny's basement. Future characters bass player, Larry Mulgaya, attends the rehearsal to help John with his drums and within months joins as their bass player. The band begins to play the New Jersey club circuit and the setlist consists of the band's favourite 60s and 50s cover songs. Fast forward to 1986 as Monkey Mania was sweeping the country thanks to MTV airing The Monkeys three times a day. A Monkeys convention was being put together for August in Philadelphia. The characters, who were heavily influenced by the Monkeys, auditioned to play the convention and got the job. Up to that point, the band was playing to audiences of two to three hundred people. This was their first time in front of 1,400 screaming, mostly teenaged fans. Another convention was being planned in Los Angeles for September of 1986 and the producers booked the characters for that show and passed the characters tape on to legendary disc jockey Rodney Bingenheimer of K-Rock Los Angeles 106.7 FM. He started playing their song Marianne on the air and put the characters in the opening spot for fellow New Jersey band Drama Rama at the Roxy on LA's Sunset Strip. His support prompted the band to move to Los Angeles in 1987. In 1986, the Characters Fan Club is started due to the influx of interest by teenage fans that the band had played for at the recent conventions. The fan club put out four Characters fanzines per year, and a special Christmas cassette is given away free to all fan club members. Issue number one of Characters fanzine is released in November, and the 1986 Characters Christmas Fan Club cassette was released in December. Every year from 1963 through 1969, the Beatles put out special Christmas flexi-discs to the members of their fan club. The records included the Beatles' messages of thanks, skits, Christmas carols and original compositions. The characters were big fans of the Beatles' fan club Christmas flexis and they used the Beatles' Christmas messages as the blueprint for their Christmas releases. Originally, the 1986 Christmas message was intended to be a flexi-disc, but this proved to be too costly, and the turnaround time for production would have meant missing the Christmas season. The advantage to doing a cassette was that the message could be longer than a flexi-disc, and it could be quickly reproduced. 1986 the 1986 Fan Club Christmas Cassette was recorded December the 7th and 8th at SRA Studios in Scotch Plains, New Jersey on an Akai MG1212 12-track machine. The characters had previously recorded their song Miss America for lip-syncing purposes for their appearance on The Joe Franklin Show a few weeks earlier and liked working at the SRA studio. Most of the skits were based on events that actually happened to the band. Bonehead and the Boiling Chip was a retelling of an 8th grade incident from when Danny and John were lab partners in science class. Songs include Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, complete with shouting of in-joke phrases over the solo, Blue Christmas and Silent Night. The band gets lost on Blick Street, Len Merrick spits, we meet Hester and someone says E. Hi, you've reached the E hotline, and we're not here right now because we're going E. The E hotline. That was uh, that was with Danny and I. Danny and I were uh, down on the Jersey Shore. I believe it was Seaside Heights or Seaside Seaside Park in New Jersey, and uh, we were staying at a friend's house, and we were hanging out on the porch. And all of a sudden, a guy came out on the porch, no names mentioned, and just started going, E. <laughs> we're like, what's that all about? <laughs> the E hotline was my friend Michael, and uh, now he's famous for that. 
South Blix, and you go up to the Jung Hills and let it put you on Blix Street again, and you keep going to Blix, and you make another left, and you go down on Blix Street again, and you go up around the Cloverleaf, and that puts you on another Blix Street, and you keep going again and again and again, and you get Blix Street, and another left, and another right out to Blix Street, and another Blix Street. Blix Street, Blix, that's an interesting one. We were in Los Angeles, I believe in the Valley. We were living out there. We had to meet somebody uh, on Blick Street, and we had the address, and all we had was a road map. Of course, back then, there was no navigation or computers to guide your way. And uh, we were on Blix. We were looking for the number, and the road just ended and before we reached the number that we were looking for. So uh, we made a left, uh, then a right, then another right, and a left, and we were back on Blix again, and the numbers kept getting higher. And we were looking for the number of the house or building, and uh, the road ended again. So we had to make another left, and another right, and another right, and another left, until we got back on Blix. And we actually did this several times until we actually found the correct address. Blix Street, yeah, that was, uh, that was a mess. We couldn't find the place we were going to. And the funny thing is, at the end of that skit, we were referencing Monty Python. When they do their spam skit, and at the end of their spam, their spam skit, they're going spam, 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 spam. And so we start going blicks, 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 blicks. Uh, Blick Street, that was, uh, we were going to this guy's house who was doing some artwork for us for t-shirts. And uh, he lived on Blick Street. We had the uh, number for his house on Blick Street. But um, the street kept on like zigzagging and then it came to a dead end, to a highway. And it, we were like, now what? Uh, but it actually continued on the other side of the highway and then zigzags some more. It just kept on going. We finally got there, though. Good evening and welcome to the Land Merrick Show. <laughs> Thank you. Tonight in the program, we have Mr. Miles Davies. And Miles, what would you like to say to all the people out there? I play first and then I spit. Merry Christmas, baby. The Len Merrick Show. That was uh, a twisting of a name of a kid we went to school with who talked like, Good evening. How are you? Like that. And so um, the guest on the show was Miles Davis. That was our pretend guest. And we combined two things. We, uh, I had seen a commercial where he's talking about a scooter or something like that. And he said... Um, I play first and then I, and then I ride or something like that. And then the other thing that I had seen the same year uh, was him talking about apartheid on TV and he was saying, I spit when I see apartheid. So we combined <laughs> we combined the two. I play first and then I spit. Merry Christmas, baby. Hi, you've reached the, damn it, we should have taken a last see in a hotline. We can't come to the phone right now because, damn, damn it, we, we should have taken a last see in a La Cienica, that was the first time the characters ever went out to California. We were being picked up at the uh, airport by some guy that was sent from the hotel. And uh, he ends up getting on the 405, 405 freeway heading north up to Hollywood. And we hit all this traffic and he's getting all upset that we're stuck in all this traffic. And he keeps on saying, damn it, I should have taken La Cienica. Damn it, I should have taken La Cienica. And we just thought, all right, I guess he should have taken La Cienica. <laughs> we should have taken La Cienica. We, uh, we were just arriving in California for the first time and the uh, Hollywood Holiday Inn had sent a guy to pick us up and drive us from the airport to the hotel. And actually it was the guy and his son and me and Chris got in his vehicle and the other two guys got in the son's vehicle and the son took La Cienica, which I guess he got there before us and we were stuck in all this traffic, but he um, drove like a maniac and it was just crazy because we, 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 uh, we didn't think we were going to even get there alive. And the whole time, he kept saying, damn it, we should have taken La Cienica. We should, kid took La Cienica, we should have taken La Cienica. So, he made it into our Christmas cassette. And he has no idea. Hi, you've reached a, we're working on a hotline. We can't come to the phone right now because we're working on it. 
we're working on it. That was a, a, a thing that a club owner used to, that we used to, a club owner of a place we used to play called the Dirt Club used to say. His name was Johnny Dirt. Uh, he always just, his thing that he always used to say was, we're working on it, we're working on it. He's working on it. We're working on it. That was uh, Johnny Dirt's famous catchphrase. He had many famous catchphrases, but that was the one that we used to like to walk around and go, we're working on it. Uh, yeah, Johnny Dirt, the owner of the Dirt Club in Bloomfield, New Jersey. That was a famous line of his that he would always say, no matter what you asked him, uh, Johnny, uh, what are we going to do about this, or what are we going to do about that, or when are we playing next? His answer was, we're working on it. That was his answer to everything he had to say. Just a roundabout way of uh, not really giving you an answer. But uh, Johnny, of course, was legendary in the original club scene in North Jersey. Uh, very influential. A lot of bands started out there. And we were fortunate enough to uh, play that room quite often. I had a great time there. We now take you back to Burnett Junior High School. The year is 1978. A young John Greco and Danny Salazzi are busy doing their science project. Hey, John, I'm going to take this boiling chip. I want to put it on the burner and see if it changes colors or something. Uh, I don't know about that, Dan. Bonehead is definitely not going to dig that. I don't care. I'm just going to do it anyway. All right. Let me put it on here. Let me see. It's not changing colors yet, but it's getting hot already. Right? Dan, knock that off of there. It was Bonehead. How's it going here, boys? Uh, it. Oh, an extra boiling chip. We have to keep our eyes on these. They are expensive. Yeah, um, uh, <laughs> ah, 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 ah. What's so funny? You boys think this is funny? You boys are never going to amount to anything. Oh, no! Bonehead in the boiling chip. That was uh, something that happened to me and John Greco. We were eighth grade lab partners, and we were supposed to be doing this experiment where... Um, you use a boiling chip to put in the water, and I, I don't know what it's supposed to do because I wasn't really paying attention when they were explaining it. But um, you were supposed to put it in the water for some reason, but instead of putting it in the water, uh, we put it, or I put it, on the top of the little Bunsen burner thing to see if it would change colors. That's That was my only curiosity about it, was to see if I could make it turn red. And um, so we put it up there, and then the teacher started walking towards us, and John said, you better knock that thing off because we're going to get in trouble. So we knocked it off and uh, it landed on the table and he saw it and he didn't realize it was scolding hot and he went and picked it up and he started, you know, screaming at us that we were never going to amount to anything. So uh, that, that's how that goes. Bonehead and the Boiling Ship. That's a classic. Uh, it's legendary in the halls of Burnett Junior High School. Uh, yeah, John and Danny had this teacher for science class. I actually had the class also, but not at the same time as them. I was in a different uh, class for that. But I did have that teacher, and uh, yeah, uh, Danny had put a boiling chip on the Bunsen burner to see if it would turn red as it got hot. It did not turn red, but it got very hot. He knocked it off the burner when the teacher was approaching. And of course, the teacher uh, picked it up to put it back where it belonged and burned his hands. And the rest of that is just uh, stuff of legends. Hi, you meet the Hester Hotline. I'm not you right now, but how would you still like to have a bite of my cookie? Da 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 da. Da 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 da. How'd you like to have a bite of my cookie? How'd you like a bite of my cookie? That goes all the way back to when I was in grammar school. I was sitting in the lunchroom, and there was a kid sitting at the table across from me, and he was. Um, having a gaucho cookie and he took a bite of it and then uh, there's another part of the story that I'm not going to include here but he said to the girls that were sitting across from him want a bite of my cookie so I saw it and I thought that's really weird and you know strange but I never said anything to anybody and then years later we were talking about you know kids from school and this guy's name came up and I told the guys the story and we were just dying and we would walk around for weeks quoting How'd You Like a Bite of My Cookie, and then <laughs> when it was put on the Christmas cassette, uh, we had kids actually showing up to the shows with like posters that said, Want a Bite of My Cookie, and the best part of the whole thing is that uh, this guy said this back in the 70s. Uh, he has no idea that uh, somebody heard him say that and didn't tell anybody, and then years later he wound up on the character's Christmas. And people are holding posters up with his phrase. Hi, I'm Seth Alexander from SRA Studios in Scotch Plains, New Jersey. And 35 years ago, 
almost to the day, Danny and the characters were right here in this studio, recording their uh, Christmas message to their fans. And it was uh, a fun, zany session, and I remember it. At that time, I had an Akai MG1212 12-track recorder, which I was very proud because some studios only had eight tracks. I had 12, which was four more tracks that the characters could fill up with their zany antics. Anyhow, the session was a lot of fun, guys. I was glad to be a part of your musical journey. 1987. The 1987 fan club Christmas cassette was recorded November the 27th and December the 2nd, 1987 at Paramount Studios, Studio B, Hollywood, California. On November the 27th, 1987, the characters recorded This Could Be The Night, a song originally recorded by the Modern Folk Quartet, featuring Chip Douglas, who produced the characters earlier in the year, and Henry Diltz, who sang the song and is a famous rock photographer. He took the back cover of the early characters and the characters' self-titled debut album. The song was written by Harry Nilsson and was originally produced by Phil Spector. Rodney Bingenheimer asked the characters to back Henry up on a new version of This Could Be The Night for his Best of Rodney on the Rock CD. Harry Nilsson came down to the session and sang a bit too. The characters recorded Frosty the Snowman at the end of this session and did most of the skits on December the 2nd, 1987. The characters visit Rodney from the 1987 Christmas tape is featured on Rodney Bingenheimer's compilation CD Santa's Got a GTO, Rodney on the Rock's favourite Christmas tunes and released on Dionysus Records in 1997. It also featured on the LP Rodney on the Rock Presents Santa's Got a GTO Volume 2 in 2017 on Gearhead Records. Rodney Bingenheimer has been closing his Christmas show with this track every year since the 1980s. Frosty the Snowman with the obligatory shouting phrases during the solo is the only song featured on this year unless you count the Hester's How'd You Like a Bite of My Cookie? The Chinsters, I'll Be Cheap for Christmas, and Am B. Davis on acid performing Leonard the Lizard. Leonard the Lizard! Leonard the Lizard! And that's Am B. Davis on acid doing Leonard the Lizard on CD. Coming up next is the Hesters doing Won't You Have a Bite of My Cookie? One, two, three, how'd you like to have a bite? everyone and welcome to the You're Nervous program. Yeah. Are you nervous? No, I'm not nervous. You're, you're nervous. I am not nervous. You're definitely nervous. You're nervous. You're, nervous. you're definitely you're nervous. You're more nervous you're than I am. Nervous. The You're Nervous program, that was uh, that was a thing between Danny and Larry, but um, yeah, Larry is definitely a nervous guy. Yeah, I'm not nervous. Uh, for some reason, Danny thought I was always nervous. Of course, he was way off base on that, which I never was, but uh, uh, going back and forth with that, kind of with the shut up kind of theme, you know, saying that I'm not nervous. I'm not nervous. Yeah, you're nervous. I'm not nervous. Oh, you're very nervous. I am not nervous. Nervous. I'm not nervous. Larry, you're nervous. Shouting phrases over the solos in the guitar parts of the early Christmas tapes. That was something we just wanted to do because we had so many in-crowd jokes that we wanted to say. and We couldn't fit them in all the skits, so we just decided to, uh, you know, just yell them out during the solos. And um, it's amazing that other groups didn't pick up on that because uh, it was kind of groundbreaking at the time. 
Yeah, the uh, shouting over the uh, solos on the Christmas songs, those were all like our little in-jokes. <laughs> uh, yeah, just a little fun we were having there during the lead solos of uh, several songs. We would just scream out uh, some of our own personal catchphrases that only really have meaning to us and nobody else, but uh, they're true to our hearts and uh, quite funny when we uh, go back and take a listen to them. And they kept shouting things over the guitar playing and the solos and stuff. And I don't know, somehow that that trend never caught on. You go in the tub. Soap's in the tub. Soap goes up your good oh, You go in the tank. Uh, yeah, that's an old one. Uh, the movie Jaws from the mid-70s uh, had a line that Captain Quint had said to um, Matt Hooper and said that um, you go in the tank and tank goes in the water, shark goes in the water. And that was a little bit of a skit that we came up with, uh, several different meanings to that. To this day, I'm still not sure what it is, but pretty funny. You go in the tank. That was the guy who um, was running one of the monkeys conventions that we played at. And he looked like Quint from Jaws. So uh, I used to say when he wasn't really listening, when he wasn't close, close enough to hear me, like, you go in the tank, sharks in the tank, shark goes in the water. Good night, ladies. Actually, they sing a different song, but we couldn't remember it at the time. You go in the tank. That was um, that was some guy we knew who looked like the guy from Jaws, the uh, the, the the owner of the uh, boat that went out to go get Jaws. I don't know what that guy's name is, but uh, anyway, the guy that goes, uh, you go in the tank. Tank goes in the water. Sharks in the water. <laughs> the guy that said that. We knew a guy that looked like that. The Gorn, uh, yeah, that was an episode of Star Trek that in this episode, Captain Kirk was battling an alien that was named the Gorn. And one of the traits of the alien was that it breathed uh, very heavily. And it was something that was very noticeable during the segment. And um, there was one day that we were driving around in Los Angeles and Chris was in the back seat. And he was leaning forward maybe to change the radio station or to see something uh, out of the front window. And he was breathing heavily on the back of my neck and I felt it. And I said, Chris, sit back. You're breathing on me and you sound like the Gorn from Star Trek. Well, all Danny needed to hear was that and he ran with it and that just stuck. And uh, it still goes on to this day. The Gorn, we were driving along uh, in the van and Chris was breathing down the back of Larry's neck and Larry started uh, yelling at him that, you know, stop breathing down my neck, you're like the Gorn. I didn't know what the Gorn was because at the time I wasn't really watching Star Trek. But uh, then when I did see that episode, I was like, yes, totally, 100%, the Gorn. No, you shut up. You shut up. No, you shut, you up. shut up. No, you shut, you shut up. up. You shut up. You shut up. Yeah, that was just something me and Danny would just keep uh, bothering each other about, you know each of us telling each other to shut up whenever we felt it was vital to do. Uh, you shut up. You shut up. No, you shut up. Shut up. Just shut up. No, you shut up. No, you shut up. Both of you shut up. Hey, you're, you're stupid and you're nervous and shut up. You're stupid and nervous and shut up. Hey, you <laughs> just said that. <laughs> What would you do if you had a category? Oh, an excellent view. And what would you do if you had a category? <laughs> it's that root beer mm. damage. And what would you do if you had a category? It's pencil? cheaper oh. that way. And what would you do if you had a category? Your. What would you do if you had a category? What would you do if you had a category? Stop saying that. Stop saying that. Stop saying that. Stop saying that. Uh, yeah, Goya. That was a reference to a commercial from years ago. Uh, the tagline in the commercial was, "What would you do for a can of Goya?" Uh, we actually knew somebody, a woman that resembled the actress in the commercial. Uh, so that was just a line that we borrowed from the commercial and used quite often. What would you do for a can of Goya? Goya. The thing about the Goya thing was we knew somebody that looked like the lady in the commercial, which was no big deal. She just said in the commercial, what would you do if you had a can of Goya? You could do a lot with a can of Goya. But it gave us an excuse to throw our other catchphrases in because it would be like, you know, what would you do with a can of Goya? And then I would say, it's you know, too delicious. And that was one of our things. And so we liked to do things that um, we were able to just bring in some of our other wackiness on that didn't really have to line up in any way. But so that was, uh, you could do a lot with a can of Goya.
the Harry Nielsen story. That was uh, Danny and I were on Sets Sunset Boulevard, kind of on the seedier side of end of Sunset Boulevard. We were going to an Italian restaurant. Can't remember the name of the restaurant, but we were going to meet Rodney Bingenheimer to talk some stuff. So anyway, uh, we're walking on Sunset Boulevard and this nice looking preppy guy kind of comes up to both of us and says, give me your money. And we're like, we just kind of laughed it off. And then he says it again, but he says it like really anger, with a lot of anger. Um, and then he looks like he's gonna pull out like a gun or a knife. So Danny and I just like take off. And uh, this guy starts chasing us. Um, anyway, we take off, we end up losing them, but we're now we're like in this alleyway that ends by this like high fence. But right on the other side of this high fence is, is the restaurant where we were heading to. And so Dan and I climb up this high fence, we're climbing back the other side. And as we're climbing down the other side, this guy's going, all right, you got it. Come on, you guys got it. Come on, let's go, you got it. <laughs> and when we get down off the fence, uh, this guy goes, what's going on? And we said, oh, we almost got, we think we almost got mugged on Sunset Boulevard. We didn't know whether this guy had a knife or a gun. And he goes, really, you think he might have had a gun? Anyway, Danny goes to, says to this guy, aren't you Harry Nielsen? <laughs> and he says, I used to be. Anyway, it really was Harry Nielsen. And um, we said to him, you know, the next, tomorrow we're going to see you. We're doing uh, one of your songs of, um, uh, called This Could Be The Night. And Henry's going to be singing it. The characters are going to be backing Henry up. So um, that's the Harry Nielsen story. Then we saw him the next night. <laughs> Leonard the Lizard is a reference to a Woody Allen movie called Zelig, and uh, I thought that movie was hilarious, and so we wanted to incorporate it in some of the skits, and um, he winds up, Leonard the Lizard winds up in quite a few things, a couple of years in a row. So as part of the character's Christmas skit, they wanted to do a, a character called Leonard the Lizard, or Larry the Lizard, no, it's Leonard the Lizard, Lenny the Lizard, and he had this really high-pitched voice. We attempted to do the chipmunk effect where you slow the tape down and record the voices and then speed it up, but we didn't have enough tape. And our tape machines only ran at 15 IPS or 30 IPS, and they were using such short pieces of tape that they'd brought in that we only had uh, 15 inches per second as a choice. And so, since we couldn't do the real chipmunk effect, I tried to use a harmonizer and it didn't sound quite right. It just was too squeaky and uh, weird sounding. So they didn't like it for the chipmunk effect, but they did use it for Lenny the Lizard. The funny thing about Leonard the Lizard is, is that when we were recording that, uh, we were using some sort of effect on the voice and Rodney was in the booth with us and he was supposed to say, that's Andy Davis on acid doing Leonard the Lizard coming up next. And we were just dying, cracking up. So there's an outtake at the end of 87, which is the funniest thing on the whole thing. Leonard the Lizard, Leonard the Lizard, Leonard the Lizard. And that's Andy Davis on acid on CD doing Leonard the Lizard. Coming up next, I got something brand new on CD. Is the Hester is doing? I like to have a. Wait, hold on. Here, the character is the actual character is doing a "Just Want You," and they're doing their Christmas tape now, and they're going to send that out to all the fans. And a lot of surprises coming up for the characters, so get ready. You never know what they're going to do next. Are we being videotaped right now? Yeah, we can do that skit too. <laughs> <laughs> 
you know I'm wondering that because I, I know there's another track. There's always another track. So they seem to say V. They have a vocal. You know what I mean? <laughs> See these things say drum. How am I gonna how do you rationalize nine things that say drum in one way or another? I'd lose some of those, get a live performance uh, with a real vocal human being. How young man <laughs> Oh I don't wanna drummers? tell my mama about this night this could be tonight. I don't wanna tell my mama about this. Mama. start the whole thing, the whole tape out, maybe. It's going to start with the wind and I'm going to go, you know, with our story opens, you know, <laughs> and, we're, and, we're out. and then, it, then we'll, first we're cold outside, and we're like, I think this is the place. I'm not sure, you know, is, is this where he lives? You know. And you go, all right, open the door, and slam it, and go, and you go, <laughs> okay, okay. all right, well, we'll not go ahead and help, and you yeah. say what's happening, okay, say, say, what's, happening. Okay, say, say what's happening, like that, I don't go, Oh, uh, we have this tape that we want to give you, and you'll go, um, yeah, slip it through the door, and I'll say, no, but it's us, it's the characters. And then you say, oh, all right, you're going to say, come on in or something? Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, here we go. So wind first? Yeah, wind, and then I'll... Our story opens on a below zero day in December. Oh, man. Oh, it's freezing. I hope, I hope, it's, I hope it's coming up soon. Oh, I don't know. Oh, I don't know. I think, I think his house is up here somewhere, guys. Let me see. There's a, there's a light on over there. Let me see. All right. I'll knock on the door. What's happening? Are, are you Rodney Bingenheimer? Yeah, you might say that. Well, we have a tape that we want you to listen to. I just stepped in the mail slot in the door. No, no but it's, it's us. It's the characters. It's us. The characters? Oh, wait. Come on in. The new up-and-coming band. The characters are here. Hey, hey, hey. It's almost like editing, yeah. So what you tell us? Matt the Fox's picture did it. So is that cool, Edwin, or not? We have one character, but I have no character. Now the main thing is this. Here's the one to be brought up. Right there. 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 Yeah, we need, this should we go to the end of the song and go at 15 FPS for the rest of this stuff? Well, yeah, the thing is, this, the thing is, this is going to be like a montage of stuff. So, in other words, the way that the guy did... What's that? Well, it all depends. See, that's why we can use the the, 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 the whole tape itself is going to be 15 minutes. But the thing is, the way he did last year with the song... The song so it's going to get some footage yeah, oh, yeah. and then I'm going to go okay, so with the go sack. Go to bed. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, it's pretty late. It's almost three. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see yeah. if you're all right. Sure. Yeah, you can. It's all faded out. See, the thing is, because what we're going to do is, well, well, in order that we record this thing, not necessarily in order that it goes down to that, that mix that tape, you know what I mean? Right. How about you, sir? When does that get... Well, we'll see. Yeah, no. Gonna, you know, get no, I'm kidding. No, no. Right. We'll, we'll do it Sunday. We'll do it Sunday. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. Wait a minute. Didn't I see you on Saturday Night Live? Church channel? Yeah, you saw him in the dream account. We just got see that thing took longer than we thought. So Chris is going back to New Jersey tomorrow. We got to get a couple of his bits on, right? Hi everybody. This is you know the characters, blah blah blah. Big head, you know what I mean? You know, want us to run through it? You know, go in there and show you what we mean? Well, we don't have to do them all at the same time. We can put down the cassette and you guys do that, or you can just do your thing and we'll put the cassette in. Well, the way we did it last year, I don't I don't know why we did it this way last year, but the way we did it was, in other words, like it was the same type of thing. There was like. We said something like, hi, this is the characters, and they're like, hooray, the big crowd thing, if you know what I mean. And it was done right at the same time. Right, yeah. Oh. And then he didn't release it for a number of years. She's only 17. She's already publicizing a monkey style group called the characters. Who did that? That was cool. That was from Alice Wrangle in the Radio Free England. England. Yeah. We, got, we got some press on So we're actually, we've got English airplanes. We please the audience. Now, lock bands don't do that today. They'll, they'll get down in the audience, and the girls are fainting at Danny's feet, who's the lead singer. If they didn't do that, I don't think I, I'd like them as much.
Yes, yes. Uh, Tony, could you say hi to Danny Salazzi from the characters? And they've sent me here a characters fanzine in the post and sent Danny lots and lots of love from Alison on his 24th birthday and also well done to the rest of the band, Chris, Larry and John. That's Mickey? That's Mickey. Are you serious? Yeah. You're kidding. Yeah. It's just a... try one more time. What's that? We'd like to say thanks to everybody though for coming out to all our shows and sending us all those cards and letters. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now I'd like to turn you over to John. Here we go, John. Happy holidays, everyone. Just like to especially thank everyone for coming down to the show. Oh, ah. We felt at home. We also felt at home and we also felt places. other places also. Alright. Alright, Donna. Fade it there, Charlie. We'll have to come up from that because it was getting dull. You think we can come up from there or not? That wasn't too good. Yeah. Let's let's hear that back. Okay. Hi everybody, this is Danny. Hey, this is John. This is Larry. And this is Chris. And, and we're, we're the characters. characters. Rickenbacker guitar. Oh, man, I, I, I'll, I'll jot that down here. I mean, how about that Samantha Fox CD? All right. Sounds yeah. cool in the background. Like, like he, he won't let running. us in. Yeah, leave it running. Uh, John doesn't like the way I said the below zero thing. He wants me to change the words. Oh, how about this? Wait, wait. How about this? We'll say we'll go like this. We'll knock on the door and I'll say, "Are you uh, are you Rodney Bingenheimer?" And he'll say, uh, "Could be." And I say, "Can we come in?" And he'll say, "Just put the tape in the, through the door." I say, "No, no. It's not. It's not about that. We want to know if you know Santa Claus. It's the characters. You know what I mean? Because that way, all right. Mm -hmm. So just say, put just put the tape through the door. I say, "No, no. It's not about that. You know." He say, "Oh, the characters. You know, I know you guys." Okay, that'll be cool. Cause, cause I was trying to think. Frank Elson. That's the reason I didn't want to keep that old one, cause it didn't make sense about put the tape through the door. Yeah, yeah, And yeah. then it's like then Frank we push. <laughs> That's all the things we have to say. All right, here we go. Drama wrong, you put drama wrong. No, no, no. These are just silly sayings like Matt oh. Bush. You know, oh, right. like you know, kind of busy right now, and uh, you know, fabulous. That's all these things are like you know, permanent smile. <laughs> Our story opens on a freezing cold day in December. Oh, man, I hope this house is coming oh, up pretty soon. Oh, yeah, there's a button on my jacket oh, and I wore sneakers. It's really freezing. Oh, Wait, I think that's his house up there. I see no light. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hold on. Yeah, yeah. All right, let, me, let, let me knock on the door. What's happening? Are you Rodney Bingenheimer? Uh, could be. Let me try knocking on this door here. What's happening? Are you Rodney Bingenheimer? Just slip the tape out of the door. No, 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 we're not here about that. We, we, want, we want to know, it's the characters. The, char char the characters? No, I'm just listening to you guys on my uh, tape machine right now. Well, here, come on in. Right. 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 What's going on? Listen, do you know Santa Claus? I know everybody. <laughs> All right. Listen, do you, do you think he could get me a new Gibson guitar? A new Gibson guitar? I think that could be arranged. Let me jot that down. I could use that new Samantha Fox picture disc. All right. I need a new bicycle to get around town, Rodney. Yeah, yeah man. Uh, that. Oh, oh, man. I need a new snare drum. Oh, I like an right. I like an old '67 Falcon. Hey, I can dig that. I could yeah. use a VCR too. A VCR? I need a new Sunny and Cher album. Yeah, 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 yeah I can give you that personally. Oh, How about right. that? Marilyn Monroe posters? Tell Santa I want some Marilyn Monroe posters. All right. Want me to tell him that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Please, okay. Man. Oh, I need a plenty of things. I could use a new toothbrush also. <laughs> <laughs> I need a four track. I need some socks. Mm. Oh, I, need, oh, I need some work boots. <laughs> hey, well, why don't you guys sit down here? Let me offer you some hot chocolate, some oh, iced tea. Oh, yeah. Oh, great. Oh, Thanks a lot. All right, Rod. Thanks. All right, that's... That one wasn't so good. <laughs> oh, I don't think it's getting any better. That's pretty good. Well, why don't we save that one and try one more time? Hi, I'm Edwin DeShazo, and I was the sound engineer at Paramount Recording Studios in Hollywood for the recording of the 1987 Characters Christmas Cassette. So in November of 1987, Frank Beeson booked studio time at Paramount Recording Studios
to record a song, This Could Be the Night, with the characters doing a cover of the Harry Nilsson song. It was originally sung by Henry Diltz, and Henry Diltz came in and sang and played banjo on the song. And we did the backing track, and then uh, Harry Nilsson came by, and he did added some vocals to it. And then with leftover studio time and leftover tape, we put together the characters' Christmas extravaganza. I don't know what you want to call it. All their skits, their Christmas skits. And we used all the, what little tape was left over that they had brought in on their own accord. So after the characters recorded the backing track for This Could Be the Night, we uh, cut the band loose and they recorded Frosty the Snowman. So these sessions were a real treat for me in that it was uh, the only time I ever got to meet Harry Nilsson and the only time I ever worked with Henry Diltz, who's a very famous rock and roll photographer. Um, also, Rodney Bingenheimer was there was for his record. And there were members of Blondie, members of Drama Rama, and all kinds of people. I think Mars Bonfire played keyboards on the track. And it was just crazy, the number of people, the hangers on. And so it was really difficult actually to get work done and make something of this production. There were some crazy sessions. And when I listened back to the Christmas special part of it, I was really surprised at how good Frosty the Snowman sounded. I was pleasantly surprised. 1988. The characters had moved back to New Jersey in late 1988 and recorded the 1988 Christmas cassette in a basement studio in Milburn, New Jersey on an Akai MG1212 12-track machine in November and December of the year. This is the most polished of all the Christmas cassettes. More time was spent on the 1988 Christmas message than any other year. Skits include Mr. Tomato, name altered, who was another junior high school teacher from the past. We meet Mr. Insane. Lord Woodbine and Simprini go to the circus. Songs include Santa Claus is Coming to Town, Deck the Halls, featuring a sped-up three-part harmony a la the Chipmunks, and Old Lang Syne. 1988 may be the only Hester-free year. And now for the continuing episodes of Lord Woodbine and his ever faithful companion, Sam Preeny. Today's episode finds Lord Woodbine and Sam Preeny at the circus. Lord Woodbine, why do they call them elephants? Definitely, Sam Preeny. Lord Woodbine, w were you shot out of a cannon? Quite, Sam Preeny. And Lord Woodbine, did you use a net? Absolutely, so pretty. Oh, absolutely. The continuing episodes of Lord Woodbine and Simprini, that combines a lot of things. Uh, Lord Woodbine was a guy, I was reading a Beatles book, and he went to Hamburg with Alan Williams and the Beatles, and I, I just like the name. I just thought it was a, a kooky name, Lord Woodbine. Uh, the actual voice that I'm doing is based on a cartoon called The World of Commander McBrag, where the guy would say, like, did I ever tell you about my adventure here? And then the other guy would go, quite remarkable. And he'd say, quite, like that. So that was a cartoon from when we were growing up. So we took Commander McBrag, we took Lord Woodbrine, and then Semprini is from Monty Python, where they're just saying a silly word, and we made Semprini his sidekick. And when you put it all together, you get the continuing episodes of Lord Woodbine and Semprini. We now take you back to Burnett Junior High School in Mr. Tomato's 8th grade history class. Ah, uh, please don't do a sketch about me. Thank you! <laughs> Mr. Tomato was one of our teachers in Burnett Junior High School as well, me and John had him, and he would say, his name wasn't actually Mr. Tomato, it was very close to that, but he would say, Please don't talk about other teachers when you're in my classroom, because you know what it makes me think? It makes me think you're talking about me. Thank you! Like that. So, uh, that's why our guy says, please don't do a sketch about me. Thank you! And then everybody applauds, and there you go. 
Excuse me, sir. What type of wood is that guitar? Why, professional wood, of course. Professional wood? Uh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. 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 Please stop saying oh, absolutely. Thank you. Hi, this is Chip Douglas, a member of the Modern Folk Quartet. I produce the Turtles, Linda Ronstadt, the Monkeys, and the characters. In fact, I told Danny Salazi one time about how I went down to Tijuana, Mexico with my high school singing group. We stopped into a little curio shop along the main street there, and I said to the guy, Hey, what kind of wood is this conga drum made out of? And he said, Why, professional wood, of course. And there you have it. Professional Wood was a story that Chip Douglas had told me when we were recording with him back in 1987 in Hawaii. And he mentioned that this guy had said that Professional Wood was the type of wood that his drum was made out of. And so uh, we decided that we would run with that. No, from France, it's Monsoug. Monsoug. The elegant fragrance of France. Yes, Monsoug fragrance. Wear it and be didactic. What is didactic? Wear it and be lascivious. Uh, what is lascivious? Wear it and buy a dictionary. Monsoug. Monsoug. Yeah, that's a, a typical Danny Salazi reference. Uh, in Yiddish, the word meshugana means silly or wacky, uh, which I guess I tended to be once in a while. Danny, of course, took the word Meshuggana and morphed it into his own term, Mansug, and that kind of stuck for a while, so uh, he would call me that every so often, I guess, when I was acting uh, wacky or silly. Still happens to this day. And now for the abridged version of The Night Before Christmas. It was the night before Christmas, and to all, a good night. The abridged version of The Night Before Christmas was we were trying to do a skit incorporating The Night Before Christmas, but it was, it was running way too long. So we just said, all right, well, let's just do the shortest thing we could possibly do. So we just said, it was the night before Christmas, and to all, a good night. And I did that in my best Ringo Starr voice on the tape. I'm Mark Godino, and I was one of the recording engineers on the uh, characters recordings. And I had a different studio locations. One was in Short Hills, and then I later moved to Summit. And the characters uh, recorded at both those studios uh, back in the, uh, was it the mid 80s, I believe, 88 and 89. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. It was like one of my, my most uh, fun memories of owning a recording studio was when you guys came in to record. The main console was an Akai 12 track, which was kind of an unusual machine in that it used a quarter inch uh, audio tape, but it was on, instead of a reel to reel, it was actually in a in a, in a case that almost looked like a VHS tape, but it was actually an, a, a quarter inch audio tape. So, and that goes right into the console. It was like an all in one console where it was a mixing console and recording all in one. So we had 12 tracks uh, to record. And if I'm not mistaken, I think we used every single one. It was fun. You know, you got 12 faders all going back and forth um, it took a, a number of passes to get it right, but we ultimately got it done. And like I said, all that got, uh, mixed down, cross faded all down into the two track digital DAT machine. Deck the halls with boughs of holly. Tis the season to be jolly. And then we were able to achieve the chipmunk effect because on that Akai 
console, there was a very speed um, knob. So I could speed up the recording of the tape or slow down the recording of the tape by I think 10%. So in order to achieve the chipmunk effect, what we would do is you would record your part speaking very slowly. And I had the very speed control at its slowest setting. So then when we played it back, I sped it up all the way so that now the, the pitch was going to be a lot higher, but because you spoke slower, it sound so you could still understand what you were saying. If you spoke at a normal voice and we speeded it up, it would, you know, it might be hard to understand. So that's what made it so time consuming. So we had to speak really slowly so that we speeded it up. It still sounded uh, coherent. 1989. The 1989 Christmas cassette was recorded from December the 5th to the 12th, 1989, in Summit, New Jersey, in a house studio on the same Akai MG1212 12-track machine used for the previous year. The band had liked the way the 1988 cassette sounded, and the owner of the studio had moved the studio to Summit. Frank King joins the band on lead guitar, replacing Chris Roselle, and makes his first appearance on A Christmas Message. Skits include The Society of Impatient People, which was the band making fun of their bosses, A Boxing Hester Returns, Stevie's Says Yes, Scooped Out Bagels Are Ordered, and Robots Get Married. Songs include Home for Christmas, written by the character's manager, Kenny Laguna, from a 45 Kenny had released on Sire Records in 1979. Kenny had given a copy of the song to Danny earlier in the year. The character's version, Home for Christmas, is also released on the Christmas compilation LP, Stuff This in Your Stocking, on Skyclad Records in 1989. It was also released as an iTunes single on Blackheart Records in 2014. Santa Bring My Baby Back to Me is taken from the Elvis Presley catalogue, and the band included an unreleased original song, Until We Meet Again. He used to terrorise you back in grammar school. I got you, boy! He said rude things on the lunch line. How would you like to have a bite of my cookie? Now, for the first time, live on Broadway, it's Jonathan Hester in Your Arms Too Short to Box With Hester. That's right! Your arms way too short to be boxing with me! Yeah. Sometimes when we were recording, uh, if something in the studio sounded like something, like with Monsoog Fragrance, uh, the track, the backing track sounded like a commercial, like for some sort of French perfume or something. So we just kind of went with that. Um, but with, um, there was a, there was a Broadway play called Your Arms Too Short to Box with God. And the guy played this little bit on a keyboard, just he pressed a button and it started playing this track. And it wasn't from that, but it just sounded like a gospel thing that would have been in that commercial. So we based a skit on Your Arms Too Short to Box with God putting in our own characters. And now, season's greetings from the Society of Impatient People. Merry Christmas, have yourself a merry little Christmas, have it now! Deck those halls, deck those halls with balance of holly, deck them immediately! Order me a bagel, make it a scooped out bagel, get it now! Get it now, do it now, get it now! Scooped out bagel, 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 scooped out bagel! The Society for Impatient People, yeah, that's a group of people that you just need to get whatever they want in a hurry and make sure it's quick. The Society of Inpatient People, I was working in Manhattan and my boss said to me, uh, order me a bagel, make it a scooped out bagel, get it now. And I thought, that's, that's comedy gold, Jerry, that's just gold. So we threw it in uh, the Society of Inpatient People. Well, I mean, I was trying to remember, you know, the old Elvis Presley recordings and I kind of had an idea of what that guitar would sound like. And, you know, I, although I, I was a recording engineer, you know, I'm primarily a guitar player and that studio really was meant for um, musicians to come in who didn't have a backup band and I would provide the, the backup instrumentation, you know, playing bass and guitar and stuff. 
So um, I'm always, whenever people come in with song ideas, I'm always hearing, you know, production ideas. So it, with the Elvis thing, yeah, I'm, I'm old enough to remember some of those Elvis recordings and what those guitars sounded like. So uh, yeah, I might have volunteered myself to uh <laughs> to add my little uh my little mark on your recording hello are you in the stevies yes uh are you in the stevies um that's an important question and of course it always requires the correct response are you in the stevies that's um if you are asked that question and you are in a Stevie's, you say yes. And if not, then you give the correct response. Yeah, the MIDI guitar, uh, that was made by Casio, as a matter of fact. Um, and it actually was a very high quality guitar in and of itself, but it also had the ability through MIDI, because uh, it had a MIDI output to plug it into my keyboard and then get all those great keyboard sounds. Um, there was a slight delay between when you play and when the sound, you'd hear the sound, but it was it was a great instrument. I had an, an EMU uh, sampling keyboard and I had some really good samples of um, solo strings, which I'd used on a number of recordings. So uh, it was great to be able to use it on your stuff as well. It's, it's very authentic sounding. So yeah, we were able to arrange like a, a little quartet. Sounded, I thought it sound, came out really well. But it's been such a long time since we did those recordings. So uh, brought back a lot of fantastic memories. Those were, those were great times. 1990. The 1990 Christmas message was recorded in November and December of 1990 at drummer John Greco's basement on Earl Street in Union, New Jersey on a four-track Tascam cassette recorder. This was the only year that features only skits and no actual songs, unless you count Tinny Records' Shoe Cats Up and the Rodeo Tramps from Mars performing I've Got Crabs. Tough Tony kicks people down the stairs and we hear sacred greed utterances, visit the retired characters and everyone returns to say goodnight. The characters fan club ended production in the fall of 1991. In December of 2020, the 10 songs from the Christmas messages were released on all digital platforms as Christmas with the characters. This release included the Chipmunk song, Christmas Don't Be Late, Hang Up Your Stocking and Christmas Time, Green Sleeves, recorded in 2018. The characters continue to record music and play shows and have shared the stage with such name acts as Joan Jett and the Blackhearts, The Kinks, The Monkees, Three Dog Night, Ray Manzarek from The Doors, Tommy Boyce and Bobby Hart, Julie Newmar and many more. The characters will be celebrating their 40th anniversary as a band in September of 2022. The story of Christmas with the characters has been narrated by me, Ian Lee, and is copyright 2021 by the characters. We hope you've enjoyed this programme, and remember, if anyone asks if you are any Stevies, give them the correct response. Hello. Are you in the Stevies? Yes. We forgot to say goodnight to everyone who 